So, all right, good afternoon. Welcome to Policy at DEF CON. This talk is a panel titled, All, your, all of your volumes are belong to terms and conditions. Sounds and it's not chaired yeah, by David Rogers. Mike. Sir? Yes. Mike. Sound. Closer to the mic. Thank you. There you go. Um, the title is, All your volumes are belong to terms and conditions, and it's chaired by David Rogers. Uh, a few announcements. This talk is being hosted on the record, I believe. Um, cell phones, we ask that you check your cell phones are silent. Is it courtesy? Um, if the speaker, if we take questions at the end, please use the mic so you can hear you and very close to the mic. Um, as a reminder, photo policy prohibits taking pictures without the permission of everyone in the frame. And with that, let's get started. Please welcome our panel. We're going to live down to your expectations, I think. <laughs> so welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is David Rogers. Um, I, I guess why am I here on uh, doing CVD? Uh, so I created the CVD program at the Mobile Industry Association GSMA, and I had to fight hard for it, so I know the pains and tribulations of it. Um, and I'm going to be moderating this panel uh, where we talk everything from vulnerabilities through to legal, through to how we can help hackers, and what's going on around the world. So um, in flow order, uh, I'd like our speakers to just introduce themselves and just tell us a little bit about themselves. So, well. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a good DEF CON. Uh, so I'm Katie Noble, Katie Trimble Noble, for some people, because you might know me in my previous persona. So I am one of the four Bug Bounty Katies. There's me, there's me, there's Katie Nichols, and there's Katie Missouris. So I'm half of the four Bug Bounty Katies in the world. That's yeah, cool. I know, it's great. Um, so I, my background, um, I worked for the US government for about 15 years, uh, previously at CISA. Um, I did coordinated vulnerability disclosure, where I ran the vulnerabilities equities process, the uh, MITRE CVE program, which I'm still a board member of, the NVD program, the Carnegie Mellon CERT CC program, and the ICS CERT vulnerability handling program. And our claim to fame was that we coordinated and disclosed over 20,000 cybersecurity vulnerabilities in a two-year time period. And I currently work for a Fortune 50 tech company, where I am the uh, director of product security incident response and bug bounty. And we won't name that company because I'm not really here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Harley Geiger, and I am a cybersecurity lawyer. Um, I'm currently with a, a law firm called Venable. Uh, I, too, am not uh, representing Venable uh, here, and nothing that you hear is legal advice. Um, you do need a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. Uh, <laughs> And uh, prior to joining Venable, uh, I was uh, in-house at Rapid7, and I was also a Hill staffer, uh, again, working on cybersecurity and privacy uh, for about 15 years. And now I help people with compliance, I help people with uh, uh, incident management, and focus a lot on hacker law and uh, vulnerability disclosure. Right. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Casey. I am the token non-American on the panel, I, I guess, that's, in terms of the... That's uh, not true. Oh, that's not true. Oh, Bookended. Bookended. Book okay, we're bookended. That's right. Okay, so f He's forget all that. He's going to mention the ashes in a minute. I'm just getting this one in. <laughs> there you go. Let's, <laughs> let's get this party started. Um, no, so I'm the, uh, I'm the founder and CTO of Bug Crowd. Um, Bug Crowd you know, we didn't invent vulnerability disclosure or bug bounty program, that was prior art, but we did pioneer the idea of putting a platform in between all of the researchers that are out there and all of the potential problems that exist on, on the defender side of things. So um, that's kind of, that informs my point of view on this subject, because we've seen quite a bit uh, in, the, in the course of the last 11 years of, of doing this stuff. Um, also the co-founder of the Disclose.io project, which... <laughs> Better? <laughs> also the co-founder of the Disclose.io project, which is basically a, a vulnerability policy standardization exercise uh, that's been running now for the better part of you know, eight years in this form, but I think the prior art there goes back to Rainforest Puppy in 2001 and, and, and stuff that existed before that. So really the idea of that is to make um, the adoption of sane uh, VDP language and, and VDP terminology easy, um, or at least as difficult to screw up as possible. Uh, and as a part of that, to actually put positive pressure on, on top-down legislative change that have been involved in things like the charging rule changes out of DOJ, 
um, you know, election security administrator guidance out of CISA in, in 20, uh, 2020, uh, BOD 2001, so on and so forth. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, already I mentioned a rainforest puppy, so maybe we need to rewind a bit in history. So, um, just a show of hands. So, first of all, who, who knows what vulnerability disclosure is? That's good, right? Like, <laughs> who knows what coordinated vulnerability disclosure is? Okay. So, ooh, a lot less, right? Um, who knows rainforest puppy? Who, who's heard of rainforest puppy? Oh God, I'm old. Okay, so the history, the history is slipping away. Wow. Um, it's, actually, you should look him up because yeah. that whole brinksmanship process is really, really interesting. Um, but I'm just going to ask, uh, maybe we start with Casey, actually. Like, just give us the very short potted history. You know, we're talking like we're over 20 years in, really, to, to all this stuff, right? Yeah, that, that poll just then makes me feel super old. So thank you for all, thank you everyone for that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the, um, <clears throat> yeah, the history, it, it, there's, a, there's a talk I give uh, titled The Unlikely Romance. And, and this is why, basically. Like, when you, when you think about where we're up to at this point in time, you know, we have reached a point where hackers and, and organizations can at least have a productive conversation. Um, that's really only a, an advance of the last 10 years um, through, through, through my eyes. And that's, you know, partly through the work that Bug Crowd's done. It's partly through the work that a lot of other people have done to keep pressure on this. That effort goes back a long ways. And I think, um, you know, really what it comes down to when you start looking into some of the stories that, that come out of the late 80s and 90s, it's this idea of, of security not even being a consideration in, in kind of the early, you know, creation of the internet, the early creation of software. And all of a sudden, people start to break things because they can. That hacker spirit starts to manifest in this domain, and and you know everyone promptly freaks out. Um, you know, you've got like <clears throat> best example of that's the CFAA, which you know legend has it uh, was was written after you know Ronald Reagan watched war games at Camp David and, and freaked out, <laughs> basically, and went to the DOJ, and and that you know the CFAA was ultimately the product of of that fear. Like the fact that the you know that prompted the creation of regulation, I think that was important to do. But that baseline, like, ah, freak out reaction, I think kind of informed how that legislation was, was created. There's lots of different examples of that, and we've had to basically claw back from that ever since. Just recall that Ronald Reagan also watched Encounters of the Third Kind, didn't he? <laughs> but <laughs> that's a different story, right? So, um, Katie used to work for the government, didn't he? <laughs> um, so, so, how do, so we kind of come all this way, there's been a lot of pain along the way, particularly for hackers who've been sued and, 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 and badly treated by companies and so on. So we got to the point where, you know, CVD is a thing and governments are advocating for it. So how do governments at the moment handle vulnerability defense and disclosure? I do not represent the government. <laughs> Uh, but I will represent. Yeah, yeah. But I will represent my own um, interactions with this uh, particular topic. So I will say that in the last, I would say probably 2015 or so, there was a what I would like to refer to as a watershed moment. Um, we really did see, start to see the U.S. government and other foreign governments. Um, start shifting their mindset towards vul from vulnerability disclosure being a terrible thing to, hey, this is, if, it's, if you see something, say something, this could be actually really good for us. Um, and I think one of the big things that made that change was really the DOD's Hack the Pentagon effort. I think when Hack the Pentagon happened, it was something that was so groundbreaking because all of a sudden the Department of Defense, the you know grudgy Department of Defense that's got all the guns and scary things was saying, actually, maybe we should take these security researchers uh, a little seriously and bring them in and see what they, what they tell us and, and test ourselves. We are confident, so let's, let's test that. Let's not be afraid. And that was a huge moment. I think that sent a huge signal to, um, to private industry and to other governments and to other government agencies. So again, DOD and the federal executive agencies, I know a lot of times we think the US government or the government and we just kind of think big government, it's all the same, but they are different and the relationships are very different. So you have, um, so I don't mean to give you a civics lesson, so I'll make it really quick. But DOD has what we refer to as a parent-child relationship. So there's DOD and then there's Air Force, Navy, you know, you get the idea here, right? So they have a parent-child relationship. And then the federal executive agencies have really a sibling relationship. So you have Department of Homeland Security, Department of Commerce, Department of Treasury. They all work together, but they're more siblings. They don't have the ability to um, 
to force each other to do things, except in slight situations, particularly OMB has the power of the purse so they can force most people to do a lot of things. But when DOD did that, it said, signaled a very strong signal to the rest of the government that they should be open to this idea as well. And then we started seeing CISA really pick it up as well with the creation of CISA, which happened in 2018, um, and the Homeland Security really picked it up from there. And so I think that that really did change it and open the door. And now we have things like hack satellite, the hack the DHS. Um, it really was groundbreaking. And it's very exciting because now, instead of the don't go to the government because the government's scary and the you know, law enforcement's gonna show up at your door, now the relationship is if you have a problem, if there's an issue, go to CISA, because CISA will help you. And that's very different for the individual hacker than it was 10 years ago. So I, I like to show that as a really great evolution of the way things could be and should be and are trending. Um, I would add on to this, the, uh, to, to the question of how the government is treating vulnerability disclosure now. Um, a couple of other developments just in the past uh, couple of years. An important one is uh, now all federal civilian agencies are required to have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. Um, so CISA, CISA worked with, and it wasn't, so CISA has the power of creating binding operational directives. Um, they're usually not really enforceable unless uh, OMB attaches you know, some, some teeth to it. And in this case, they did. So CISA and OMB worked together. Now all civilian agencies should have a vulnerability disclosure process. If you look at, you know, pick the Department of Education or HHS or something like that, um, you should be able to find their, their VDP page. Um, and it is, in fact, um, a bit more permissive. Of, you know, it provides a, a measure of authorization that we don't see as often in the private sector. Um, so that's, that's one piece. There's, there are several others. We are seeing CVD being brought into regulation uh, as well as, uh, and, and particularly for government contractors, for uh, IoT devices, um, and uh, as well as best practices in a variety of sectors. An important one is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, so the cybersecurity framework is used it started out for just critical infrastructure, but now it's being used in a lot of other sectors as well. It's sort of the gold standard for risk management, and CVD is in there. Um, the last thing I'll say about it, it, it relates to the treatment of hackers specifically. Um, we have, and starting in about 2018, we saw uh, the Department of Justice in more, on more than one occasion step up and create and, and advocate for specific protection, legal protection for security researchers. Um, they did this, uh, we mentioned the DMCA uh, earlier, uh, the, the, the DMCA, uh, the Department of Justice, in two different occasions issued letters to the Copyright Office saying we should not be charging hackers under the DMCA. And it was very influential in getting strong protection for security research under DMCA. Uh, I think what is it, about a year and a half ago, the Department of Justice also changed a charging policy under the CFAA saying that prosecutors should decline to prosecute good faith security researchers for good faith security research. Like they're not going to you know, they're not going to withhold if you're, if, you're, if you're doing extortion or something. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, the federal government has made tremendous strides on C uh, adopting CVD and protection of hackers. Uh, the places that I think we need to catch up now actually are the private sector and the states. These, these things that we've just discussed are not necessarily there in the, in the private sector, not as much adoption as CVD, and the states still have, like the, all the things that we've complained about for CFAA are present in state law. But there are other countries around the world. <laughs> so <laughs> I just want to, I'm being flippant, but I, I just want to touch. So, um, so my own experience. So uh, I can give you a kind of war story here about uh, how successful really uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure as a concept has become. And you see this sort of, um, you know, snowball effect of, of governments and understanding and adopting it. So uh, back in 2017, I wrote a document uh, to create some principles on IoT security. Um, and that was in a government committee. And I put uh, vulnerability disclosure policy as a key requirement on IoT manufacturers. And there was a guy in the room and he said, um, we can't talk to the hackers. We shouldn't be talking to hackers. And it was that kind of age old issue that all of us have fought for years and years and years. And, but I, in that moment, I was really, really confident because we already had uh, two ISO specs so two international standards for vulnerability disclosure, and it was already adopted as good practice by companies uh, on the west coast of the states. So I, was re I had that moment, I was really confident to be able to say, no, you're talking complete rubbish, and we got it through. 
but that, that sort of attitude still persisted and it was great to have the reference points. And I always think that we're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants each time we move this subject forward. Uh, and you're seeing this thing, so that, that thing became an international standard and it was adopted across the world. So in Australia, Singapore, India, Turkey, and it's baked in. And it's also now law in the UK through the Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Act, which is the PSTI Act. And that in turn, and I know that's not subject to this panel, is starting to create new discussions about what we define as computer misuse. Um, and that, so it feels like that's the kind of next step in this story maybe. So I want, to, I want to bring up a couple things internationally that cast a shadow over this largely positive picture that we're painting. Um, so yes, it is, it is true that CVD is being adopted, I think, not just in the United States, but around the world. That's, that's good um, and, and helpful. Uh, when uh, Europe, uh, they, they passed the, 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 the NIST, II, uh, NIST II Act, uh, we saw a, an infrastructure being set up for coordinated vulnerability disclosure we thought was largely positive. It applied mostly to critical infrastructure, like what we think of as critical infrastructure, you know, and each member state was supposed to have a process for sort of processing vulnerabilities. Um, then China came out with a vulnerability disclosure law. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with some of the details of that law. Um, but essentially, when it comes to vulnerability disclosure, uh, as, a, as a, an individual hacker, you have the, uh, the, the ability to disclose your vulnerabilities to the Chinese government directly or to the vendor who then must disclose to the Chinese government. And as a vendor, you are required to disclose vulnerabilities that you receive to the Chinese government. So you're, you're encouraged to have a, 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 a vulnerability disclosure policy, you're encouraged to have a bug bounty, but it's a giant sucking sound of vulnerabilities flowing to the Chinese government. That's right, that's right, so within 48 hours. Now the, the other development I just want to highlight here as well is uh, in, in, in Europe presently, uh, the, the EU is currently considering something called the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, the CRA. And the Cyber Resilience Act has, has, is, is flown under the radar quite a lot in the United States. I'm, we're only talking about the vulnerability disclosure part of it, but this is a, this is a huge law. Um, it will have a GDPR-like effect on security, and it is going to pass. It is going to pass. They're actually at an advanced stage. Okay, vulnerability disclosure under the, under the CRA, um, there are three different versions, but the nut of it is that if you uh, have an actively exploited vulnerability, so for, you have software in the EU, and you discover you have an actively exploited vulnerability, you must notify either ANISA or Scissors, depending on how it shakes out, within 24 hours. Within 24 hours. If you've had an actively exploited vulnerability, 24 hours later, it is likely not patched, right? It is likely not mitigated, mm -hmm. and you are telling government agencies about it. Now, again, there's multiple versions. Uh, they're gonna consolidate them, but some of the versions would have that first agency that you talk to send it to other agencies who then send it to other agencies, leading to about 55 government agencies in the EU. If you have software that's deployed across the EU, um, it, so, it is a rolling list of software packages with unmitigated vulnerabilities. The point is, so CVD, great, but we are also sort of seeing that process co-opted in a way, right? We're going further left of boom uh, to the point where we are sort of forcing disclosure before people are ready and doing it in situations where we are putting those vulnerabilities at risk of being used for surveillance or, or tipping off adversaries. So what we're seeing is a kind of governments potentially taking advantage. We've seen companies already take advantage, right? Uh, of situations and you know there are always constant issues of NDAs and, and um, private disclosures and, and sort of almost unwritten threats against researchers so it feels like they kind of were blindsided by it originally and then now they're kind of getting to grips with it I mean what, what do you think about that Katie would you agree yeah I think that that's that's exactly the case I think that um, there as the as and I'm a little bit concerned because as I see the uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure principles be adopted across industry, but there are still a lot of big companies uh, that don't have coordinated vulnerability disclosure programs or that are are trying to stand them up. And these are international companies. Um, so as these regulations continue to, some are good regulations, some are bad regulations, and as they continue, um, you start seeing industry pull back. And so that progress that's being made um, positively is now being pulled back a little bit. 
Um, think about this from an industry perspective. If you have a product and it has a vulnerability in it, 24 hours, have you even had an opportunity to triage that vulnerability yet? Do you know it's a vulnerability? And now the whole idea of coordinated vulnerability disclosure, that was something David said. Do you know about vulnerability disclosure? Do you know about coordinated vulnerability disclosure? Coordinated vulnerability disclosure means that um, all parties agree that they will treat this vulnerability under embargoed status until a point where all parties are able to accurately disclose that vulnerability in a way that doesn't give an adversary an advantage, right, when a mitigation is developed and disclosed. So if you're disclosing vulnerabilities within 24 hours, what you are doing is you are enabling an adversary to be able to exploit a customer or end user. And I don't think that's the goal, but you see right there, you have a law that's about to be passed and you have the technical details of that and the impacts of that are so wide reaching you get to a point where you say, why are we even doing coordinated vulnerability disclosure anymore? Why don't we just put it all on Twitter or simply not have a CVD program? And that's dangerous and it's, it's undoing a lot of the progress that's been made over the last 10 years. So, I hate to say, you know, it feels like a chill <laughs> is spreading across the world. <laughs> is, that, is that what's gonna happen, Casey? Uh, well, yeah, sure, let's go with that. Um, <laughs> Look, I, I, I think in general, like the, the way that I'd, I'd um, kind of render out what's happening as you know, someone who lives in, in the US and San Francisco, but also has a, a home functionally in, in Australia, right? I'm thinking about this through the Western lens. Um, <clears throat> and what I see happening is that Western countries are trending towards transparency as a, as a, as a mode of resilience, right? Transparency is anti-fragile. That's kind of a design principle that's being used to push this along. Um, and I think that's a lot of how it's been sold, frankly. You know, within government, it's, it's a lot of how it's been pushed downhill and how it's been adopted. And that's certainly something that, you know, we've taken advantage of as bug crowd. I've seen, you know, the folks working on the Disclose.io project take advantage of as well. It's just a security model that seems to make sense, right? Um, on the flip side of it, you know, non-Western countries do tend to be trending towards control or aggregation just in general, because they're, they're, you know, ultimately there's a, there's a motivation there to build up firepower. Like they want, they want resilience, they want defense, they want to be able to fix the bugs that get found, but they also want to increase their capability um, from, from a sovereign you know, capacity standpoint. And this is a pipeline for that. So you know, I do see it kind of heading in that direction. And obviously that's a, that's a you know, 300,000 foot observation. I do expect that to continue because ultimately I think transparency as a, as a resilience strategy wins in the end because it's fundamentally anti-fragile, right? But if the other approach manages to land the first set of punches, um, that could change the, uh, the outcome. So you touched on something there, which there's been articles about one country hoarding vulnerabilities recently, actually. Um, so is this maybe this kind of, I want to say arms race, but it's probably not an arms race, it's just a... I don't know what it, quite what it is. What, what is it? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the international relations environment's gotten progressively more tense, you know, and it's always been tense, but I think that tension's become more obvious, um, you know, post-COVID, right? Um, so I think, yeah, the idea of, of yeah, and, and this is through the lens of, of, of an Australian, you look at what's, this is all on public record, like there was a budget of, uh, I think, $97 billion dollars in a project called Red Spies, which is specifically around standoff deterrent capability in case there's something that goes hot in the, in the region, right? For you know, reasons that should be sort of fairly obvious that the Aussies are nervous about that. Um, I think it's 2.7 billion of that's going into cyber and that's offensive and defensive. So it's, it's capability stockpiling is ultimately what it's about. That's what, that's what I've kind of observed is um, that there's a lot of sort of, you know, endorsement of offensive now that, that wasn't there before, right? Yeah, I think it used to be a dirty word, and that's, that's I mean, you think about these conversations, I always go back to the um, FBI versus Apple in, in the San, B San Bernardino case, yeah. I think it was 2016, and at the time, you know, to, to create zero day and weaponize it for offensive use of any sort was kind of dirty, like mm. there was this sort of stench around it. Um, <clears throat> but then you look at the, there was a lead time between when that happened and when it came out who was actually responsible for that, um, 
as, a, as an organization, it's like four or five years later, they're actually celebrated and it was an Australian company. It was actually celebrated as an Australian startup story. So in that time, it went from a dirty, a dirty word to a thing that was kind of accepted, which is and this is like amazing. The, as I said, this sort of dark secret of forensics tools. They, they, like these companies try to like play off how in, in genius they are, but a lot of them are buying vulnerabilities off the grey market, right? And there's a healthy like you can go to the Zerodium website and see their little, you know, table of elements and the prices that are attached to them. Um, I know obviously Project Zero has been trying to, to counter some of that stuff, but you know, not a lot of people know about that either, do they? I mean, can, you, can any of us sort of discuss that a little bit more about um, the gray market and vulnerabilities and, and I guess how that operates? Is... Who wants that one? <coughs> <laughs> sure. Go to the Zerodium website. I mean, <laughs> It exists, right? Yeah, it, it absolutely exists. I think I think vulnerability discovery, um, you know, it, 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 the way the way that I try to pass this out to explain it and even to think about it is that there's defensive and offensive vulnerability procurement, right? Um, the defensive procurement cycle, basically, you get the bug and you kill it, right? Um, the offensive cycle is where you get the bug and you actually productize it, um, and and as a part of that, you would, you work to keep it secret so that your, op your capacity stays operational in the wild and it doesn't get burnt. Um, <clears throat> so everything leading up to that decision of whether or not you, you, you burn it or, or keep it alive looks pretty much the same. Um, you, it's, it's basically vulnerability research, you know, discovery, like thinking through impact, thinking through usability, like where the attacker is gonna be coming from and what kind of capability and access they need from that vulnerability, because not every vulnerability is eligible for this type of you know, purpose, right? Um, but there's a lot of researchers out there that, that can do that stuff. And I think you know the, the thing that's the thing that I find interesting at this point in time is is even with some of these legislative changes that are happening, um, like grey is the perfect way to describe it because I think it's becoming less illegal or less kind of tightly regulated in a way that I think will actually kind of dictate some of the outcomes that we'll see if you think forward ten years. You think also. Also now a factor in the in the gray market. A couple of things. One, the and you know uh, Casey alluded to this, but the but the the, the profit, the, the the price point for uh, you know, vulnerabilities being used offensively is going to be higher than for defense. It puts defense at a disadvantage. Um, and part of the reason, as as Casey said, is you know for for defensive purposes, you want to you want to plug the vulnerability. Offense can be used multiple times, or you sell it under NDA so that you get a higher price for it, so that you can you can sell to sell it to a single buyer. It is a it is an issue. But the the other force also though is uh, you know we we want to encourage this being used you know this this process for defensive purposes. The uh, the White House is is currently looking at ways to deal with the offensive market. Uh, there was uh, recently an executive order on commercial surveillance uh, uh, brokers. I think I think four of them went under sanction recently as well. Um, and so it it in, and it is it is difficult to sort of you know to to find that. That, uh, that that nexus to human rights and, and be able to distinguish between the use of vulnerabilities for you know legitimate police operations versus oppressive purposes, um, but that space is being looked at now. Yeah. If I could just, just just really quickly on the pricing piece, Harley's, Harley's exactly right, and this is actually a phenomenon that we see a lot of, um, actually demonstrated in in bug bounty, which is you know de defensive uh, vulnerable procurement. So on on the one side, you know if you're selling a vulnerability that's going to be productized like that is inherently more valuable as a transaction. The thing that works in favor of the defender is you've got the prisoner's dilemma. So if Harley and I have both found a bug um, and I'm trying to sell it off to the, to the offensive buyer, he's trying to sell it off to the defensive buyer. If he lands the punch first, then I lose the opportunity for the bounty plus the opportunity to exploit the bug because it gets burnt at that point in time. So that's, um, that economic kind of delta works in both directions. So I'm just going to comment on the and kind of what Carly was saying. When we think about vulnerabilities used offensively, I think um, we're in an age now where we have to seriously consider the impacts of the things that we do. And I'll, I'll use an extreme example here, but anything can be used for good and anything can be used for bad. And think about nuclear power. It nuclear power for power plants, nuclear power for weapons. And the difference there can be things like regulations and informed decision making and an informed community. Because we have the ability to influence the decision making and the, the legislative process and the regulations and standards that go around these, um, this market. 
And I think we're starting to see that with the White House, which is a wonderful thing, and I'd like to see more of that, because we're at a cusp now where it's becoming very common to understand um, cybersecurity. There is no real world and online world or anymore. You know, used to be, oh my god, my Twitter went down, what am I going to do? Uh, now you can't get a job without the internet, you know? Uh, COVID really accelerated that for us. So it's becoming more in the forefront of humanity that we understand how cybersecurity works and that we have that informed process. Because if we don't, it will pass us by. And that's something that I would empower everyone. It's part of the reason the policy village is here, a policy department is here at DEF CON, to help people who are very technical talk to, to policymakers so that we can have an informed decision-making process. And I think to close the loop also on, on policy and the, uh, uh, what we were just discussing as far as uh, offensive versus defensive use of vulnerabilities, we should be directing our policy developments towards uh, uh, streamlining the ability for people to disclose vulnerabilities. And so the, what we had talked about at the outset about greater adoption of CVD, that's one way to do that. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the greater legal protection for hackers for acts of good faith security research is another way to do that. There's still room to go, though. We talked about uh, uh, China's vulnerability disclosure law. We talked about the EU. Starting, you know, if, if you are a, an, a, a hacker and you are disclosing a vulnerability to a company, and you know that company then has to disclose that to a whole bunch of government agencies, you don't know what's going to happen. There's a couple of things as a, as, a, as a researcher, you may feel conflicted about making that disclosure. Uh, and, and then as a company, you may not want to have to kick off that process every time someone discloses to you. So we are, we are seeing policies that are kind of going in both directions, where we were, we're making it more difficult or at least a greater moral choice, a moral conflict for, uh, for vulnerability disclosure at the same time that we're easing it in some ways. Uh, another great one that uh, you know, we, we are hopeful that the U.S. government will take on is uh, sanctions. Uh, so there are, there are questions about the, the extent to which uh, vulnerability disclosures are a sanctioned event uh, or sanctioned transaction. You know, if you are a U.S. company and you're receiving a vulnerability disclosure from an individual in a comprehensively sanctioned nation or somebody that is two hops removed from the SDN list uh, and you are asking follow-up questions but not paying or anything like that, you know, and there's, no, there's no money exchanging hands, that should not be a sanctioned event. Um, as of now, this is in a gray area. Um, but this is something that we are hopeful that can change, and it is for the purpose of you know, greasing the skids for defensive use of vulnerabilities, taking away incentives, taking away that easy path towards offensive use. I guess for some researchers, especially you know, some of the more na naive ones, they, they might not even realize that they were talking to a nation state as well. So there was the infamous conversation, the, the George Hot Zero Day iPhone uh, recording that happened. Um, and it could have been naivety, but was he trying to sell a vulnerability to China? That was the debate at the time. And I guess nation states might get a bit smart and just false flag the, false flag the researcher, right? Or host a, host a bomb contest. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I just want to, like, so frequently when I talk about this with companies, they get mixed up between bug bounty and vulnerability disclosure. They also get mixed up with vulnerability disclosure as well. So I was, I was, giving a, I was doing a deposition to a government committee, and clearly they didn't understand. They thought vulnerability disclosure was forcing companies to disclose vulnerabilities publicly. So I just want to, so let's start on the bug bounty thing. So... I guess, Casey, first of all, just explain the sure difference, please. <laughs> yeah, so, so um, <clears throat> when I speak to this, um, I think there's an there's a added piece there that um, bug bounty is often used interchangeably with crowdsourcing at this point in time as well. So it's, it's like <laughs> words are hard, basically. Um, but I think for the purpose of <clears throat> you know, reg like the, the regulatory kind of renderings of this, uh, and I think how you know, most people coming into it think about it, uh, the definition I go to is uh, NIST 853R5, which is basically that a vulnerability disclosure program is a, it's an intake point, it's a policy, and it's a process that allows people from the outside world to, to submit a vulnerability into an organization um, and to have some sort of expectation of what happens next, effectively. And that's a, that's a butchered version, but that's the cliff notes of it. But what it also does is it distinguishes it from a bug bounty program. So it basically says a bug bounty program is if you do everything that we just said, um, but what, what you also do is you reward someone with cash uh, if, they, if they do this and they're first to find and report a unique uh, issue. Um, 
usually the way it works is that's, that's kind of the model. So the first defines the one who gets paid, and the more impactful the issue, the more they get paid. So what you're ultimately doing you know, on the proactive side is incentivizing the things that you want and actually mimicking kind of some of the economic you know, incentives that exist for the adversary. So that's, that's the purpose of it and how it works. But you know, the, thing, the reason that confusion happened, because obviously I've had a box row seat for a lot of, lot of this story, um, <clears throat> bug bounties just got sexy really fast. Like the, the thing that happened with, with Hack the Pentagon, which was huge, hugely valuable, I think, for, for um, you know, reforming the public perception of what a hacker is and actually helping tell a story of their place in, in the safety of the internet. It's like if the apex predator of the planet relies on 16 year olds to, to give them security feedback, then maybe I should do that too, right? And like that was a pretty massive shift in thinking that happened at that point. <clears throat> but it was all talked about in terms of it being a bug bounty. And, and I think, you know, like us as an organization, I think some of the other platforms that joined after, after we started the category, you know, hackers getting paid money and being able to celebrate that, that's a thing that's exciting to talk about and that's fun. So all of this led to most of the, the focus of terms of art actually being around bug bounty. Um, even though, like, frankly, it's, it's actually the minority. You know, from, from, my, from my own perspective, like, VDP is something that absolutely every, like, that is a cost, that's a bar of entry, you know, must be this high to ride the, the internet um, type of thing at this point in time. You know, bug bounty, um, in the public sense, is discretionary. Um, some organizations are ready to do that, others aren't, because they're just not ready to remediate or listen to the internet in that way. One other, one other good distinction is uh, authorization, right? So for, for a bug bounty, you are, you are authorized to, you know, to try to find vulnerabilities and use certain testing methods against a defined scope of assets. A, vulner a vulner vulnerability disclosure po uh, policy can do that. Um, you can provide authorization, but many don't. Many are just a channel saying, look, if you, have, if you find a vulnerability, disclose it to us, but we're not guaranteeing that you know, we are, you know, it's get out of jail free or anything. Um, uh, in fact, the U.S. government uh, for uh, civil agencies does provide authorization. They're, they're, it's, it is the more advanced form of VDP uh, where there is some authorization, which provides, and the reason authorization is so important is because it provides legal cover for the security researchers that are trying to find the vulnerabilities. Um, but to, to Casey's point about VDP being, a, should be a fundamental practice at this, at this stage, you can have a very basic VDP that does not provide that authorization, and you are still, you know, ed edging into that world. It is still helpful. So I'm going to jump in real quick. So to simplify, um, a VDP is a see something, say something. A bug bounty is an invitation to hack. So there's a difference there. And I like to think of bug bounties, payments, or rewards. I don't like to think of them as rewards. I like to think of them as reimbursement for your time. Because how much time and effort was spent in researching that vulnerability, triaging that, or not triaging, developing the proof of concept, submitting that vulnerability to a company, going through the, the, um, the friction of even filling out a submission, because each company wants it a little different, and going through that whole process, and then working with that company. Maybe that company has follow-on questions, um, that back and forth. So I see it as a reimbursement for your time rather than a reward. And I will tell you, I work at a Fortune 50 tech company, and this is becoming a, a very um, common way of reframing the narrative of what's actually happening. Um, it is a way to offset um, the dark market um, and give people an opportunity, those who want to do good in the world and those who have a in intrinsic motivation to be positive and to help defend, it's an outlet for them, but also it's a, it's a mechanism of saying thank you and we appreciate your time and recognizing your time. That's a really good point, and I've forgotten to raise this topic, but the value of labor is a real big question, right, for security researchers that people, many hackers feel they're essentially being exploited by governments and, and companies for, for their time, and that there's, a, there's not a recognition of that. But is, is that a fair statement, or do, do you guys have different views to, to that? Sure. <laughs> um, I think that um, you know, the, the, other, the other piece, like frankly, this, this goes back to one of the reasons I, I founded Bugrat in the first place, is that it does distribute access um, on both sides to the answer to the question that they've got, which is, is this thing vulnerable or not? Mm -hmm. So you think about that, you switch that into the defender side, you know, previous to crowdsourcing, previous to, to bug bounty, 
you're basically held hostage to whatever hourly rate you're getting uh, to get consulting. And ultimately, like one person being paid, so you've already got a supply-demand imbalance there. Um, and then you've got the problem of one person being paid by the hour, you know, probably never being able to actually outsmart all of the potential adversaries that could figure the solution out before they can. So I think there's, <clears throat> there's a counterbalance to, to that, what you just brought out, in that um, you know, I think um, the security consulting industry has been incredibly overpriced in different areas yeah. with, with a very much a caveat emptor approach to quality. What this does is it actually brings quality to the fore. Um, so I think that there's that part of it that's pretty important to call out. But also, you know, on the, on, the, um, on the payment side, it's an interesting one, and obviously I'm gonna have some bias in my answer here, but you know, people don't have to participate. Like, there's no arm being twisted in terms of their own participation. And I would add to that, like, I, I partly agree with, with Katie how you were rendering what the purpose of payment is. I actually think about it more in terms of the value of the data. Like, if, if you know, the organization running a program has a question, whoever ends up giving the answer has that answer, then there's a value to that transaction that's more tied to the data in terms of the payer, right? On the researcher side, maybe it's got to do with the amount of time that, and effort they put into it, but ultimately, that doesn't really matter in terms of the marketplace dynamic there, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it, I guess it um, depends where you come from in the world and what yeah. the cost of living is, exactly. right? Uh, exactly. You know, uh, the value might be huge, it might be life-changing. Um, so I just really, we, we don't have much time left. I just really want to give the audience the opportunity to ask any questions, um, if, if you'd like. Uh, I know Casey has to dash off to, to, to deliver a talk, so I don't want to hold him back. But um, you, you have a great opportunity to, to speak to some of the world's greatest minds in, in vulnerability disclosure. So, David. Good afternoon. Uh, super interesting. Uh, what are folks' thoughts about, I'll say, U.S. government, because we've got multiple governments sort of represented here, U.S. government coordination as it relates to very recent regulations put out by our good friends at the SEC that can actually end up driving victims to disclose, like, really sensitive stuff in the middle of their trial. Totally agree. I think the SEC has made a very bad move. Uh, so for those of you that are not familiar, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission has, has actually historically been a very forward-leaning agency when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, and they, they actually have done some really great work in trying to push public companies towards being more transparent about their security posture and, uh, you know, and, and securing their, their, their systems of control for financial reporting. Um, so, so I want to have that caveat. So they, they recently came out with a rule. The rule does a lot of things. Um, and much of the rule, I think, is positive. There is one aspect of the rule that's getting a lot of attention, and rightly so. And this is on incident reporting. And so what that does is uh, it requires all publicly traded companies to report their cybersecurity incidents within four days of determining that those incidents are material. And what that means is materiality means like that you determine it's significant enough that you, you know, somebody ought to know about it. But as we discussed with regard to vulnerabilities, the, with that four days, you may or may not have contained or mitigated your incident. Now, that reporting through the SEC is public. It's public by default. So it goes, you report it through your 8K form, your 8K becomes public as, a, as an investing document. Um, and that is the Securities and Exchange Commission's purpose. It is to provide information to investors. It is not really to, you know, with this regulation, to strengthen cybersecurity. Um, we, we, you know, the SEC has heard that, um, and they, they heard it not just from private industry, uh, but from, uh, from consumer groups, as well as I know uh, from other government agencies, U.S. government agencies. I was surprised that they kept that timeline in. Arguably, companies were already supposed to disclose their cybersecurity incidents. What's new is this timeline, this four-day timeline after materiality. Um, I thought that they were going to have something about, you know, maybe if you haven't contained or mitigated your incident, perhaps you can delay disclosure, you know, and, and have some other things on top of it. No dice. Instead, what they said was, uh, well, here's our, here's our exception. Um, if the Attorney General asks the SEC in writing uh, to delay because there's a threat to national security or safety, then, then they, there can be a delay. It's like that is not going to happen, right? That is, that is a very, very low number of incidents. So for those of you that work at public companies, you will probably 
functionally, what's going to happen is if you have a cybersecurity incident, you're going to have to draw on more parts of your team. You're going to draw in your corporate attorneys who should be familiar with the concept of materiality, as well as your corporate communications, because you will be disclosing this incident publicly within four days. Hi, uh, I have a question about Safe Harbor. Uh, one of the things I've noticed recently is that it, it's pretty common for Safe Harbor language to exist in programs launching now, but I've noticed a trend of them including request per second limitations, and I would like to know where I'm wrong in my logic. If you, for instance, take Visa, they launched a program recently with a one request per second limit for testing, you can't load a web page, and you know, you're exceeding that automatically. Why is Safe Harbor not meaningless in that scenario? Sounds like poorly written rules by people who were uninformed. Yeah. But, yeah, but you, you see, like, it. Yeah. Daisy, that's you. <laughs> that, uh, well, I mean, what Katie said, uh, like, I, I think there's, <laughs> basically, I think there's, um, there's a bunch of things like that that you see. A lot of, a lot of the, uh, the recommendations and policy kind of guidelines that exist in, in bug bounty programs in particular, uh, are basically copy pasta that's like 20 years old um, or, or more, right? So, <clears throat> you know, there, there might have been a point in time or some, some organization or some program at some point in time that said, okay, here's a particular rate limit that we want to put on this program because of blah, blah, blah. It made sense, right? Uh, but the idea of that being, you know, a, a useful way, like really what they're saying is don't, please don't hammer our stuff, right? It, like the idea of actually putting a specific number on that's a bit silly, but I, I kind of get the intent behind it. I think with, um, with, with the safe harbor component of it, you know, if, because usually safe harbor clauses are written as a if this, then that, and the, the this is if you follow the rules, these conditions, then that will, you know, authorize you against CFAA, exempt you from any circumvention for DMCA, will, um, uh, exempt you from um, TOS violation, and we'll just say that what you're doing is a good thing, right? That's generally how it works. And yeah, your point around like the, the this actually being pretty important alongside the that, um, it's well understood. I, I think you know Harley would probably be better to jump in on the legal side, but I can. I, what I'm trying to do here is paint a picture of why that happens and why that exists. And oftentimes it is a balancing act between like getting you know creating comfort. On, on the side of the organization putting these policies out there and it being like fully complete from that side. So um, before we take the next question or before Harley comments, um, I'm gonna give you your, your fleeing rights <laughs> to leave the room. So um, please thank Casey for joining us and good luck with your talk. So um, it's all right, you, you all don't have to leave. You can stay and talk to us. Um, so um, next question. Thank you. I'll be cognizant of time, but I think this is pretty relevant. Um, okay, so governments starting to mature and enable their citizens to report vulnerabilities. We think that's naturally a good thing. Everyone on the security researcher front, you can think, hey, I have a little pr extra protection here than I had before and can sleep a little easier when you report something. But as governments start to kind of wisen up and like all around the world, not just ours or, or any other particular ones, and encourage people to report vulnerabilities, What's to stop governments from starting to really emphasize other countries, you know, citizens of other countries reporting vulnerabilities to them? Because we might be friendly with some folks in public, but behind the scenes, there's always an information war race going on. And I was curious if everyone had a take on that. I, I can't hear very well. Oh, I'm so sorry. So, so, you, okay. so yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. So, so basically, as this becomes, uh, so I guess, sort of quite nationalized reporting uh, to these schemes, does that then have a sort of blowback on the individuals and their nationality? So, for example, in the mobile industry, we have this pan-industry reporting scheme. We have people from all different countries, from all you know, individually, and companies that are in different countries. Are are there going to be kind of? Do you think that, the, that some companies, countries, may start to re restrict people from nationalities that, that um, just because of where they're from, basically? So I think. So the, I think the answer is yes, uh, but I also think it differ, differs by country. So uh, China's vulnerability disclosure law that we, we touched on earlier uh, does in fact uh, have a restriction on reporting your vulnerability outside of, uh, outside of China. Um, I, I, I don't have the exact language in front of me, but there is, that, that is in there. Um, how, I, I'm actually very curious to know how, how companies are, are you know, actualizing this. 
um, particularly multinational companies that are based outside of China but have operations in China. Um, but, uh, but, but yes, so if you are an individual there, like, like I said, you do report to the vendor who reports to the government or you report to the government, you are not authorized. It's, in fact, there are criminal penalties if you make it public or if you report to some other government outside of China. Um, for, but most other, most other nations that I'm aware of, even the, the, the law that I would describe as, as negative on vulnerability reporting, uh, this, the Cyber Resilience Act in the EU, it, that, that included most other laws are, are not, do not really require you to report directly to government as an individual, right? So uh, you report to the vendor, and then the vendor has certain obligations, but you're not punished or restricted generally as an individual from reporting outside. Um, I don't see that as a trend so much outside of, outside of China, and um, you know, maybe there are other countries that are more authoritarian that, I'm, you know, that have something like that. I'm sure, I'm sure there are some unspoken codes in certain countries, um, but I'm, I'm not really aware of them personally. Now, the other, sorry, uh, the other restriction is uh, on the exports, or sorry, the, um, uh, the sanction side. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Katie talk about that, but that is, that is the other way that you know, they can discriminate against individuals based on their geography. Lynn, can I, we close I was, that? Yeah, we'll, we'll just let me finish oh. the and we'll go ahead. Um, so there is one other way, and Charlie just said it. When we think about sanctions, U.S. government sanctions specifically, and this happens across the world, there is there are a couple ways sanctions impact. But one of them is if you are in, an, in a researcher in an embargoed country, if you try to submit a vulnerability to a U.S. company, that U.S. company may not be able to receive it and may simply IP block you. So they can't actually even receive the information from a sanctioned company because they don't want to have the possibility of having a sanctioned event happen. So they simply do IP blocking. And so that means that you can't prove a negative. I don't know how often that's happening because it's being screened. And so that's a, a, a perfect avenue where you're having individual researchers who in some cases may be taking great personal risk upon themselves for trying to do the right thing and report it to the vendor prior to reporting it to their highly oppressive or, <laughs> government. You know, um, so sanctions, um, clarifying sanctions and upgrading sanctions, U.S. sanctions and sanctions for other countries across the United States is something that should be taken very seriously. Those regulations should be, should be um, updated to apply to reality as we understand it. And I think Lynn's going to kick us off now. Okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.